Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's better to be to be uh, at the end of this uh, workshop and conference. Um, but we're very happy to have Oscar telling us about overview of axion astrophysics and perspective and future astronomical growth. Thank you. So for who don't uh, know uh, me, I, I'm Oscar Sanier, and uh, my salary is paid by the Italian National Institute of Astrophysics. And my expertise is mainly concentrated in uh, modeling stars of any mass and initial compositions. Uh, so from the sun to progenitor of supernovae and uh, the related nucleosynthesis. And today um, I want to essentially illustrate uh, you the potential of using stars as a laboratory to investigate to investigate uh, um, uh, new physics, so fundamental physics in general, and in particular, uh, how to constrain uh, the physics uh, of uh, Hessian or an Hessian like particle in general. And uh, uh, sorry. Okay, so. Um, uh, the, the, the goal of this kind of study is to use um, stars as a laboratory, as I said, uh, the immediate goal at least. But in the future, um, once uh, hopefully action uh, uh, will be detected, uh, we may use them uh, as uh, um, messengers uh, to provide us information about the astronomical sources of, of these particles. And uh, and something is, uh, has been already done in this direction. For instance, there is, I don't know if uh, uh, Sebastian Hof uh, is here. Um, okay, he's there. Uh, he has recently uh, uploaded in the archive a paper in which uh, uh, show how it could be possible in the future to use the sun, uh, to use the action emitted by, um, from the sun to investigate the internal temperature uh, in the core uh, of the sun. And, uh, but there are also uh, other examples and some of them I will show uh, later. So the, 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 the tool um, are uh, uh, models of the astronomical sources and uh, of course, uh, accurate measurements, astronomical measurements that include uh, photometric studies, spectroscopy, astrometry, and, and uh, other kinds of measurements. And um, possible sources, uh, here is an, a, a, obviously an incomplete list uh, of already investigated sources. Uh, the sun, for instance, the sun uh, is a relatively unevolved star. So uh, the temperature is not so large and the action are produced by thermal process. And those, and, and, but uh, the sun is the nearby star that we have. And so for this reason, it's largely studied. And uh, the bounds uh, to the strength of the, of the coupling of the interaction of action with standard particles uh, are weak in general, but uh, there is this possibility to detect with action telescope, as you know, uh, um, action uh, emitted uh, from the sun. Um, and uh, an another in other interesting uh, um, Mm, uh, astronomical sources of action like particles are uh, stars in globular clusters, and I will talk about that later. Uh, and right now, uh, the more stringent bounds uh, to the coupling with photons and electrons come from this kind uh, of sources. And uh, similarly, also very important are compact remnant of stellar evolution, in particular, white dwarfs and neutron stars. And um, also supernova uh, progenitor uh, are interesting also because in this case, uh, a, a possible detection with X-ray telescopes uh, uh, could be addressed. And, um, and of course, core collapse supernovae uh, that are currently used to fix bounds to, to the couplings. And, uh, and then going, uh, uh, to the extragalactic sources, uh, we have to uh, mention uh, the active galactic nuclei, in particular blazars, uh, 
And also in this case, it could be possible to exploit the conversion of photons of actions or action-like particles into photons. That is a general property of these particles uh, to detect then uh, uh, searching uh, um, in anomalies in the spectra, in the X-ray spectra of these uh, objects. And then that matter, but I don't say nothing about that. Okay, so um, the method, the method is simple, no? The method in which we, that we use to, um, to exploit stars as a laboratory of fundamental physics is very simple. We have to identify some macroscopic properties, the luminosity, the temperature, the chemical composition, variation in the, of the chemical composition that may bring information about uh, uh, some deviation from the standard physics, no? Uh, and then uh, we investigate uh, uh, the, um, this hypothesis uh, by comparing uh, the theoretical prediction of these macroscopic uh, uh, properties with uh, the observed one. Um, the main issue is to take under control the overall error budget, because of course, if you, if you underestimated the error, we may misinterpret a deviation from the, uh, a disagreement uh, between theory and observations. And so this is the most, uh, 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 the most tricking uh, um, part of this job and the most important and tricking part of the job. Just uh, an example of that, uh, this is the um, energy conservation equations uh, in uh, stellar interiors in the right hand side uh, of the of this equation, we have the luminosity gradients. The luminosity is the power uh, of the star. And uh, in the, um, sorry, in the, in the left side, in the right side, we have the, all the local energy source and sink, no? uh, that may modify the luminosity. And uh, it in, this include uh, uh, nuclear um, energy, so energy released by nuclear reaction, essentially fusions uh, among uh, light particles. And then uh, uh, the, the variation of the internal energy uh, of the star um, uh, due to essentially conversion of the potential, uh, the gravitational potential energy into internal energy through the, uh, uh, for example, when the star contract or expand to change its volume, According to the first principle of thermodynamic, we have a variation of the internal the entropy. And then we have also to consider energy sinks, you know? uh, and, and the most important are thermal neutrinos. These are different from the neutrinos produced by nuclear reaction, which are included in this term. These are neutrinos produced by thermal processes like Compton scatterings or, or Brennstrahlung or or uh, plasma decay and, and, and so on. And uh, when these are active in stellar interior, they, uh, uh, since uh, uh, neutrinos are weakly interactive particles, they have a mean free paths much lar larger than the, the stellar radii, so they escape freely when produced. So they act as an energy sink in stellar interiors. Okay, so uh, we can integrate that over the, the bull uh, stellar structure from the center to the surface, and we get the luminosity, which is an observable. We can observe the luminosity of stars, and so we can compare that uh, with uh, observations. Uh, <laughs> so suppose that we found a disagreement between theory and observations. And so we, we have two possibilities, essentially. Um, hater, uh, this disagreement may be due to error in the theoretical recipes or in, in, in the observations uh, that we have not considered, or there is missing physics, uh, some missing physics. And here are some examples uh, concerning the equation we have seen before, uh, the, the energy conservation essentially. So uh, for instance, a non-vanishing neutrino magnetic moment may change the neutrino production rates, now may increase you know, the, the, the possibility uh, to have uh, uh, in addition to uh, weak interaction, also electromagnetic interactions, uh, we may, this may increase the neutrino production rates and so modify the predictions uh, of the luminosity. So no standard energy sinks, uh, like the thermal production of action-like particles, uh, and these uh, introduce an additional terms 
in the right hand side of the equation you have seen before. And in case of massive actions uh, or massive helps, uh, we uh, the, the, the condition that the mean free paths uh, is much larger than the, the stellar radii is no more valid. So we may produce and at the center this particle and then they, they, may, they may decay or they may interact uh, before escaping. And so they act as an energy transfer mechanism in addition to the radiation, convection. And, uh, and so we have to modify the equation of the energy transport uh, to take into account massive particles like this one. So, uh, um, so some example of theoretical errors that may uh, affect uh, this analysis, this investigation of new physics, uh, practically any uncertainty related with these uh, uh, energy production and sink rates. Uh, for example, an unknown low energy uh, nuclear states uh, may affect the cross section uh, of uh, nuclear reactions. And, and this may lead to a, a worse uh, um, evaluation of the epsilon nuclear. So some example of observational error, well, any um, statistical and systematics affecting parallaxes, uh, photometries, uh, light extinction, and so on. All, the, all, all that will affect, uh, would affect the observed luminosity. So we have to consider both and uh, to try to analyze them in order to get the constraint essentially to the coupling constants, uh, coupling of action with uh, photons and with uh, electrons. And I show now some example of, of what we can do with globular clusters. Globular clusters uh, are a bunch of stars, a group of stars, you know, uh, up to 10 to seven stars uh, uh, bounded by gravitational reciprocal gravitational interaction. And they are very common <coughs> um, in any kinds of galaxy. In, in the Milky Way, we found globular cluster in the halo. So they are among the oldest stellar population. Typical age are 12, 13 giga years uh, among the oldest object in, in our galaxy. And also in the bulge, you know, in the central uh, very dense regions, uh, uh, one or two kiloparsecs since the galactic center, uh, we found globular clusters. And, uh, but also in M51, Andromeda galaxy, which is uh, a, tw a, a twin of the, of the Milky Way and other galaxy, uh, a small galaxy like the Magellanic Cloud, which are satellites of uh, our galaxy or dual spheroidal galaxies. And, and as well as in, uh, giant elliptic, ellipticals like M87. Uh, so it's very com common uh, building blocks of galaxies, these globular clusters. And uh, the characteristic, they are relatively simple stellar population, even if, even if uh, recently has been discovered discovered that there are, they harbor multiple populations. But in general, they are considered quite simple stellar population with star with similar uh, initial chemical composition, at least the first generation of stars, and, uh, and with a very similar age, because uh, practically the same age, because the formation process lasts uh, for a very short time compared to the age uh, of these uh, stars. And, and so what we see when we are looking this uh, uh, global cluster star are essentially isochrons, no? It starts with uh, different mass, but uh, uh, um, uh, similar, uh, similar ages. And, and this is what we observe, no? This is the color magnitude diagram or exponent Russell diagram. You, you have already seen that many times. Essentially in the vertical axis, we have the magnitude, in this case, in the blue band, no? The visible band, which is uh, centered around uh, 600 nano uh, meters of wavelength. And uh, so this represents the luminosity essentially, the power. And uh, in the horizontal uh, axis, we have uh, uh, the color, the difference between the B magnitude and the V magnitude. The B magnitude uh, is, uh, uh, represents uh, the luminosity in the, in the 
in uh, the blue part of the electromagnetic spectrum that is at short late wavelength uh, with respect to the B. And, uh, and we recognize in this plot uh, the various sequences, uh, the main sequence MS here, which represents stars that are burning hydrogen uh, within the core, uh, like the sun. And then after the main sequence, when the hydrogen is exhausted uh, within the core, uh, the star evolves in the red giant, RGB, this long uh, uh, sequence made by made by giant star, the, st the core contract and uh, eventually the density increase enough that the electron, the electron components becomes uh, uh, degenerate. And, uh, and when we reach the tip of the RGB here, we have density in the center of the order of one millionth of uh, uh, gram per cubic centimeters and the temperature around 100 millions of Kelvin. And, uh, and these stars are, are characterized by having a, a, a degenerate helium rich core surrounded by a, a convective envelope made of hydrogens. And uh, on top of the, uh, at the base of the, of the hydrogen rich envelope, there is an active uh, hydrogen burning shell. Okay. So in the center of these stars, in the, in the core of these stars, uh, uh, neutrinos are produced by plasma decay and, uh, and possibly action may be produced by the uh, process. So uh, more evolved than the red giant are the horizontal branch stars, HB, which represent stars that are burning helium within the core. And after the helium burning, when helium is exhausted and, the, and, and, and a core of carbon made of carbon and oxygen um, is formed, the star evolve, uh, uh, come back to the giant branch and becomes asymptotic giant branch star. During the asymptotic giant branch star, uh, the uh, envelope is uh, eroded by an intense stellar wind. These are quite bright objects. And, and so uh, what remain is a dense uh, core made of carbon and oxygen and the star. Uh, and when this happens, the star move uh, to the blue part and entering the so-called uh, post-AGB and uh, white dwarf cooling sequence. Be essentially, these stars are um, uh, progenitors of white dwarfs. Okay, so uh, looking at these HR diagrams, uh, we have uh, different processes that may be activated, that may produce actions, uh, that may uh, be activated uh, in these uh, evolutionary phases. Uh, here, the observable, the, the luminosity of the tip of the RGB, which uh, is the point where the helium burning start, essentially, um, uh, is, uh, uh, is affected by Brenstralung actions, production. Uh, the luminosity function of RGB, uh, similarly, the luminosity function is essentially uh, a plot in which we have how much star we found at different luminosity uh, along the RGB. So this marks the evolutionary time scales along the RGB. Ah, and important things that I forget to say is that uh, that merged from previous. Okay, as you see, we have a lot of stars in main sequence, but when the star evolves, the number of stars uh, is less and less. And this is because the evolutionary time scale becomes shorter and shorter. So the smaller is the evolutionary time scale, uh, the lesser is the number of stars that we observe in this evolutionary phase. So if the main sequence lasts for giga years, the uh, horizontal branch lasts for uh, 90 million of years. Uh, and so the re and these uh, explain why we have a lot of star, we observe a lot of star in main sequence and only a few during the horizontal branch because the star remain in the horizontal branch for a shorter for a shorter time. Okay, so different process and uh, uh, and uh, and different observables that we may exploit. So uh, ah, this is also another interesting uh, parameter that we have used to constrain uh, essentially the Primakov, um, um, the the um, the coupling with photon from Primakov. 
Um, and uh, also error Lyra, uh, pulsation of probably error, error Lyra are variable stars, are, are variable horizontal branch stars, no? They have periods, uh, regular periods of a few hours. They can be observed and there exists a relation between the mass, the luminosity and, uh, <laughs> um, and the positional periods of these, uh, of these uh, variable star and and these uh, properties may be affected by uh, a production of thermal uh, actions. Okay, so the, what we need uh, uh, to carry on this kind of study, this constraint, uh, from the observational point of view, this is the requirement of the astronomical data. Uh, we need multiband observation. This is important because what we compare is the bolometric magnitude, so the, the luminosity integrated over the blue uh, electromagnetic spectrum. So we need to observe a different uh, um, photometric band uh, and collect this uh, multiband observation in order to reconstruct the energy, the spectral energy distributions. Uh, then we need uh, to combine uh, uh, um, observation from space, which uh, uh, allow us to, to, to resolve the central part of the globular cluster, which contain a, whose, the density of star there is so large that the, the seeing prevent observation from Earth. So we can re resolve the core, in most cases, the core of the globular clusters, even from Earth, uh, from ground-based telescope, even with the uh, adaptive optics. But from space, this problem of the sea, of the turbulent of the atmosphere disappear. And so we, even with the Hubble Space Telescope, and here you see the resolution power of the Hubble Space Telescope for the cluster 47 Tucane. Uh, this is the cluster, and this is the observation made with the Wildfield Planetary Camera on board of the Hubble Space Telescope. And we see how we can resolve start there. And this is important because we have to uh, uh, increase uh, the statistic to, uh, to observe much more star as possible. Uh, and then we, we need astron astrometry. Uh, astrometry uh, essentially uh, is a measurement of the proper motions of, of, the, of the star. This is important because there are contaminations from field star that have nothing to do with the cluster stars. And so we have to eliminate them and we can do than by measuring the proper motions. Only uh, stars uh, that uh, uh, have a motion in common with the central mass of the, of the clusters uh, should be considered. And the second uh, important thing is that with, uh, with uh, astrometry, we can uh, measure parallaxes. And this is the job done by the Gaia satellites, which, is, uh, uh, which was launched five years ago. And now we have... Uh, a much better understanding of the distance of this object. And this is important because we have to correct for the distance in order to get the luminosity. Mm -hmm. Okay, from a the theoretical point of view, uh, we have to construct a sequence of models that start from the pre-main sequence. So that when the first hydrostatic uh, equilibrium models start, <laughs> uh, and this is an homogeneous start chemically, uh, quite cool. Uh, and then we leave that to evolve and the star evolved because we lose energy. And because when, term, when uh, nuclear reactions are active, there is a transformation of the inter a change of the molecular weight. And, 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 the, um, and both these uh, effects produce, uh, induce an evolution of the stars, the evolution that we have seen in the color magnitude diagrams. And so we have a sequence uh, of, uh, of models from the pre-main sequence up to the final hand, so the white dwarf stage. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we need the, to, to repeat this calculation for different masses, because what we observe, remember, is an isochron. So different masses, same age. So we, we need to suppose that the age of the cluster is uh, 12 giga years. We have to pick the point along the evolutionary sequence uh, corresponding to 12 giga years of different evolutionary tracks corresponding to different masses. And this allow us to construct an isochron to be compared with the color manual diagram that we have seen. 
So evolutionary practice, a model, a single cellar model is made by solving this set of equations, essentially, uh, essentially four plus N um, equations uh, that describe the evolution of these physical quantities, no? the radius, the luminosity, uh, the pressure, the temperature, and the um, mass fractions uh, of the N uh, species, uh, chemical species here. And uh, of course, we need appropriate boundary conditions uh, at the center and at the surface as a function of what? As a function of the internal Lagrangian uh, mass uh, coordinates, uh, the MR here uh, defined. So essentially the mass uh, within the radius R, contained within the radius R, and uh, the time T. Uh, these, um, uh, uh, these equations describe uh, a non-rotating star, a spherically symmetric non-rotating star. So this is the simple model. But by the way, most of the, of the um, our understanding of cellular evolution is based on the uh, kind of models. Uh, of course, uh, uh, if you introduce rotation, we have the deviation from the spherical symmetry, and this is a bit more complicated to follow, but we can do that. And also, in some case, also the magnetic field, which is not included in this equation, so may play a role. Okay, so how we modify that by introducing the energy um, um, production rates due to action here, um, um, the formula we use, it, the equation we use it to calculate the, uh, the Epsilon Compton, Epsilon Bremstrahlung, and, and Epsilon Primakov. Essentially, these are de derived from the uh, uh, many works uh, published by Georg Raffel and collaborators. And, and, uh, and we have made some modifications, uh, but essentially uh, the recipes are based on that. If you are interested, you may find uh, that. So. Uh, the tip of the ray giants. The tip of the ray giants here uh, is a, um, a good uh, estimator of Bresselanum actions, of the action produced during the RGB by, by, by um, um, uh Why only Bresselanum? Essentially because all the other processes like uh, Primakov and Compton are suppressed because they are the generacy that develop in the core of red giant stars, while Berenstraum survived and, uh, to this um, uh, drawback. And when the star arrive uh, in, uh, uh, at the tip here, essentially made by an helium core, an helium rich core, uh, outside there is the hydrogen rich envelope and then the hydrogen burning shell. So during the red giant, the hydrogen burning shell, the mass of the core increased because the burning in the shell here, okay? So the radius, uh, since the, uh, due to the equation of states of the generate uh, matter, uh, the larger is the mass, the smaller is the radius. No, there is a, a scale as the, the mass, uh, the, the radius scale as the, the inverse of the cube of the mass. Uh, and, and, and so the, 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 the radius gets smaller and the mass uh, increase. And when the mass is around 0.5 solar masses, the conditions for the emission of helium um, are configured. And here you see what happened. Due to the equation of states, uh, uh, we have the, the nuclear energy released by the triple alpha reaction that form uh, carbon um, um, increase the local temperature, but the pressure does not change because the pressure uh, of, the of the general matter essentially depends only on, on, on the density and not on the, on the temperature. So, and, but the increase of the temperature uh, increase the rate of nuclear reaction. So there is this positive feedback that uh, uh, produce a thermonuclear runaway that is that this uh, huge peak uh, up to 10 to 10 solar luminosity uh, produced by the triple alpha. Uh, reaction and these occur outside the, 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 the center because in the center where the density is higher, uh, thermal neutrinos produced by plasma on decay uh, cool down the center. So the maximum is uh, around the maximum of the temperature is around 0.2 solar masses since the center. And so this flash 
occur here, not here in the center. And then we have a, 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 the, the increase of the temperature remove the generacy. And then we have a series of smaller flashes, uh, uh, more central, more central, more central until the burning, until the burning reach the center. And, uh, and this is the beginning of the horizontal branch. So uh, when this happened, during this very rapid phase, this lasts less than one million year, uh, we have big uh, uh, um, circle in these uh, uh, diagrams made by the stars, but uh, the probability to observe stars during the flash uh, is practically zero because this evolutionary time scale is very short. But when uh, the, finally the, the, the burning reached the center, uh, <laughs> the star uh, settle in the horizontal branch. And this is called helium burning stars. These are uh, called helium burning stars. So we have neutrinos produced by plasma and decay and eventually Bremsstrahlung actions. And, and you see that while neutrinos are mostly produced near the center, here you see the uh, um, energy production rate by, by loss, sorry, energy loss by plasma uh, decay, uh, while action, uh, Bremsstrahlung action essentially depends on the temperature or on the power of the temperature. So the maximum production of action is in uh, where the maximum temperature is outside 0.2 solar masses. So we have this, diff so in, in, in this sense, uh, uh, neutrinos are more representatives of what happened in the center while action are more representatives of the layer where uh, the temperature is maximum. Okay, so what happened when we, to the RGB tip, when we uh, consider in models, uh, the action production here is illustrated, the effect on the volumetric magnitude, so on the luminosity. So essentially uh, the, the, the RGB tip becomes uh, brighter and brighter so depending on the coupling. Okay, so here is pressed in, in, in power of 10 to 13. Okay, so uh, the volumetric magnitude is defined here, how is the luminosity in solar luminosity. And this is the, uh, three, the three line that represent three different uh, uh, metallicity. The, metal, <laughs> the metallicity is essentially uh, the, um, the, the amount of uh, heavy elements, heavier, uh, elements heavier than, than carbon, including carbon uh, in the original composition of the stars. And global classes span a very large range of metallicity, and you you see how uh, the effect of the brightening of the of the RGB tip uh, um, change uh, changing the metallicity. Okay, so we have uh, just to uh, okay. Most important is to fix the uh, various problems, in particular as I have anticipated the problem of the distance and to have, to have multiband observation in the optical, in the optical red and near infrared photometric band where most of the black body radiation from these stars, from RGB stars come from. Okay, so. And this is the results we get by collecting 21 globular clusters, the RGB tip luminosity of 31 globular clusters. The dot represents the measurements of the volumetric magnitude. And uh, <laughs> while the line represents models, the black line represents models, the, the solid one is a, a standard model without actions, okay? And while uh, uh, this dotted line represents a model in which we have assumed a, a GA, E uh, for 10 to, min to minus 13. And this is the previous bound uh, at the time we, we uh, have done this work. And the dotted line represents a, a, less a less square feet of the dots, of the observations. And this is the, uh, the likelihood function that we get. This was a, a work we have published in 2020. Uh, um, on astronomy and astrophysics. And, uh, and now with, uh, uh, thanks to the, essentially thanks to the uh, improved distances from the parallaxes obtained with the Gaia astrometric satellites, uh, we get a better, a better 
reproductions. And this is the, the red line represents the um, uh, new um, likelihood. And this is the present bound that we get an 85% confidence level. Uh, we can exclude uh, uh, couplings larger than essentially one 10 to minus 13. Uh, Okay, this is the historical evolution of this bound based on the RGB tip from the pioneeristic uh, work uh, made with one clusters uh, by Vio et al. in 2013. And then there, are, there was a many paper up to our paper um, uh, here in uh, 2020. And this is the most recent one based on the Gaia uh, measurements of the distances. Okay, so <laughs> so another observable is the that concern the number of stars, so the evolutionary time scale essentially. So when we measure the number of stars in a given evolutionary phase, we are measuring the time scale of this evolutionary phase, and of course the cooling induced by uh, the energy loss uh, induced by the production of thermal action. Uh, may modify this evolutionary time scale and then the number of stars that we observe. And, uh, and so uh, we started to investigate uh, uh, <laughs> this possibility uh, by using essentially horizontal branch stars compared to bright red giant branch stars. And essentially we define this, uh, the, these R parameters. The R parameters is the number of horizontal branch stars and uh, over the number of red giant branch stars. And this essentially measures the duration of the horizontal branch compared to the duration of this path of the evolution along the RGB. So if we neglect the coupling with the electron and consider only the coupling uh, with, uh, with, um, with photons, so the, the most important process that may produce action is uh, the Primakov one and to a less extent uh, the, the Primakov, of course, and uh, and uh, the air parameter. An important thing is that the air parameter depends on the original helium content of these stars. And the, historically, the air parameter has been used to constrain the cosmological helium because remember that these stars are among the oldest stars, so probably one of the first stellar populations in our universe. Okay, so here you have the measurements. Uh, um, in uh, 36 to 39 global clusters. And this is the weighted average that we get of the air parameters. And then we compare that with observation starting from the evolutionary tracks here. Uh, uh, and you see the red giants, uh, the horizontal branch and the asymptotic giant branch. These are theoretical evolutionary tracks. And with that, we may construct uh, these uh, uh, iso this uh, synthetic color magnitude diagram. These are theoretical color magnitude diagram, and we may use exactly the same approach uh, we have used for the measurements of the air parameters in a real uh, color magnitude diagrams. And so we get the theoretical color magnitude diagrams, okay? In this way. Oh, sorry. Okay, so this is the effect. This is to show the effect of variation of the air parameters uh, as a function of the abundance of helium. Okay, and you, we get these uh, lines uh, changing the coupling of the action with uh, photons in, in 10 to 10 uh, 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 GAEV uh, minus one. And, uh, and, and we see where the measured value is here. Uh, here we have the uncertainty in the statistical uncertainty in the measurements of the air parameter, but also the uncertainty in the in the helium abundance. Okay, so we get this analytic solu um, uh, equation that de describe uh, the effect of uh, a, a coupling with uh, with photons, and this is uh, well, this is the error analysis. Uh, I have no. Uh, based on Monte Carlo simulations. Um, I have not much time to explain that. There, we have to take in, under control uncertainty in the nuclear reaction rates that may modify the horizontal branch uh, 
uh, evolutionary time scales. And so this is the result, essentially. And we get these results, uh, this bound uh, that was published in 2014, a yellow tail paper, and revised uh, in 2017, uh, Australian yellow tail paper. Uh, and this is uh, um, uh, similar to what has been obtained uh, by the CAS collaboration with solar actions. Okay, what happened is we also consider the coupling with the electrons. In that case, we have to one parameter more to vary in our analysis, and this is the, the three parameter likelihood that we, we get in this case. This introduces essentially an effect of, uh, on the Regian branch, so on the denominator of the R parameter, the number of stars along the RGB that is affected by Brenstralon, uh, as I told you before. And so this is the likelihood and uh, the results of this uh, combined analysis is this one, essentially. And we get, uh, uh, essentially we confirm the, 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 the bounds uh, on uh, previously obtained by, for uh, uh, the coupling with the gamma uh, in case of uh, no uh, coupling with, uh, zero coupling with uh, electrons. And we get this coupling uh, for the electron, uh, for the electron with action electrons, and uh, and this is uh, uh, less stringent than what we get with the RGB tip, uh, as I have shown before. So what happened? And this is for uh, action that freely escape. So they are produced near the the center, let's say, or in the core, and then they do not interact with stellar matter and they escape. And, but what happens if I increase the mass? If I increase the mass, I have to consider additional processes like photon coalescence, and also the possibility that the mean free path is smaller than the stellar radius. And in that case, we have uh, energy transport uh, induced by these uh, action or action light particles. And, and so we have repeated by changing the mass uh, in this paper by Karen Setal, 2018, we have included the photon coalescence and more recently, we have developed an algorithm to treat the action trapping inside stars. It's a sort of ballistic, uh, of ballistic uh, algorithm. And uh, we get this red line here that was published in 2022 by Lucente et al. Okay, compared to other bounds. Uh, so interesting. Uh, in this plot in which we have a uh, two parameters plot in which we have the coupling with photons and the electrons and the limits um, achievable by different experiments, uh, present and future experiments, uh, the bounds uh, we get from uh, stars, from global class of stars exclude this yellow area here. So this, I think this is the most uh, interesting results that we can eventually discuss. Okay, so let, let me change the kind of stars and go to massive stars. So stars with mass larger than 10 solar masses, uh, they are um, the progenitor or core collapse uh, 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 supernovae. And, and why these stars are interesting? Well, but because during the advanced phase of their evolution, they develop uh, quite large uh, temperature and, 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 and density, you know, from the carbon burning in advance. And uh, in that case, the production uh, of action becomes an important source uh, of cooling. And as you see here, or energy loss, and you see here during the helium, the hydrogen and helium burning phase of these stars, uh, the energy loss is dominated by the radiation from the subphase. But from the carbon burning and beyond, uh, you see here, compared to the photon luminosity, the luminosity of neutrinos, uh, the black line here, and, the, and eventually the, lum the luminosity of action becomes the dominant. Uh, and you see that from the carbon burning, which is marked at the onset of the carbon burning, the beginning of the carbon burning is marked by this dot here. And you see that the, neutrino luminosity 
is expected to increase uh, uh, before the core collapse of six order magnitude. So a huge energy loss uh, in the um, pre-explosive stars. Uh, and in case of action also, we have an increase of uh, at least four order of magnitude. So this means that, uh, of course, these evolutionary phases are extremely short. So we have to be lucky. But if you can identify a nearby red supergiants uh, that uh, um, are approaching the core collapse uh, in the carbon burning or uh, neon burning or oxygen burning, uh, we may uh, have the opportunity uh, to detect, uh, to detect uh, the action emitted by the stars. Much more easy to detect action than neutrinos because neutrinos can only interact weakly. While actions in the magnetic field of the galaxy uh, may be transforming into photons. And so we, we, need, we can observe that by electromagnetic interaction, X-ray um, X -ray photons. So uh, these make uh, actions uh, potentially good uh, messengers. Of course, that depends on the, on the coupling. If the coupling is too small, we have no chance, but if the coupling is large enough, we may have the chance to detect action much more easily than neutrinos. That is in, in view of the multi-messengers uh, astronomy. Uh, <laughs> oh, this is interesting. Here you see a supernova. Uh, here is reported uh, which supernova it is. Uh, some, somewhere, okay, oh, uh, here he is, the 2008 BK, okay, and this is a pre-explosive images, and this is the a post um, uh, um, explosive images when the supernova disappeared uh, of the same field, and you see that we can identify the progenitor that is not present here, and it coincide with the location of the supernovae. So this red supergiant is the progenitors. And this has been done for a few, let's say less than 20 supernovae. Uh, it was possible to measure uh, the luminosity of the, and the effective temperature of the progenitors. And here you see uh, some of them, the most reliable one of them. And these are 2P supernovae. 2P are uh, the most common kind of core collapse supernovae, more than, 80%, probably 70% of the core collapse supernovae <laughs> are 2P supernovae. And they are hydrogen rich. Uh, uh, when they explode, they have an hydrogen rich envelope. And, uh, uh, for, and the P stay for plateau because for a period of 100 days, more or less, and even more, the luminosity remain constant. And this is the, the phase in which uh, the shock wave um, is traveling uh, um, within the stars and the envelope, the hydrogen rich envelope expands. So the photosphere move inward. Uh, the photosphere is located uh, in the region, in the layer where the, the um, uh, hydrogen uh, uh, recombine, no? So about uh, um, 10,000 uh, Kelvin degree. And so uh, if the envelope expand, this layer move inward, no? Expand and cool. This layer moving in word, and uh, and it lasts uh, uh, about one hundred days, uh, depending on the mass of the envelope of the residual envelope at the time of the explosions. This may reach, uh, uh, this may reach the the base of the envelope, and this is the plateau phase. And then the following evolution of the light curves uh, is driven by the radioactive decay. Ten minutes, okay. So. Here you have the comparison with theoretical evolutionary tracks of different mass. And uh, in this way, and this is the location of the progenitors in the color manual diagram. So we can uh, measure the mass by making this comparison, the mass. And the problem here that we have discovered is that the mass measured in this way is typically smaller than the mass measured the, by looking at the supernova outcome. So the mass of the progenitor affect uh, the light cubes. So fitting the light cubes, we may um, estimate the mass and also the chemical yields, in particular the oxygen, which is uh, the oxygen yield, which is observed in the nebular phase. So a late time, 
uh, uh, depends on the mass. And so these are two other independent ways to measure the mass. And uh, unfortunately, only for a few uh, uh, supernova, this is possible. Here you see the, the mass estimated from the color magnitude diagram from the pre-explosive uh, uh, pre-explosive uh, uh, luminosity. And here the mass is estimated by using uh, uh, the supernova outcome. And you see that uh, 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 there is a clearly uh, a, a, a discrepancy between them. Uh, this kind of object are not a problem because rotation, fast rotation move this in this direction. But what is different from a theoretical point of view, it, it, it is to explain by changing the standard physics, let's say, uh, to move then above. So we uh, so uh, this is a problem, and we have investigated if action production may explain that. And actually, this is the case. The, uh, as a consequence of the cooling induced by action, what we found is that uh, at the moment of the explosions, uh, the supernova for a given mass, this is a 20 solar masses model, uh, the supernova is fainter. The, sorry, the progenitor is fainter than in case of no actions. And so this may explain this, uh, and, and in principle, this may be used to constrain the coupling uh, with electrons and so on. So uh, here you see a model of so supernovae or so progenitors of so a 20 solar mass at different evolutionary uh, uh, stage. And, and you see here the time left uh, uh, to the to the final core collapse. So uh, I, during the healing burning, we uh, the the time left to the core collapse is uh, more than one hundred uh, uh, um, um, thousand uh, years. But when we go ahead in the carbon burning, neon burning, um, uh, uh, we see that the the evolutionary time scale becomes shorter and shorter. And when we arrive in the neon burning. Uh, we have only 3.6 uh, uh, here to the explosions. So suppose that we may detect uh, a, a actions or neutrinos uh, uh, um, from these stars, and we have seen that the luminosity is very high in, in these uh, late evolutionary phases. Uh, from the macroscopic property of the star, we cannot uh, 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 say in which evolutionary phase is, uh, simply because here you see the effective temperature and the luminosity. And you see that practically since the end of the healing burning, the luminosity does not change, it's freezed. And uh, the same for the effective temperature. So it's, uh, looking at the star with uh, electromagnetic uh, um, radiations, we cannot say nothing about the evolutionary sta uh, stage. But instead, both neutrinos and actions but action are more, much more easily to be detected, uh, um, uh, tell us about the central temperature that instead is, is changing order of magnitude. Here we have uh, uh, a few uh, billions of Kelvin degree. Here we have uh, 100 millions. So the, the central temperature change a lot uh, during the final uh, uh, stage. So we, if we have a message that come from the core, we can understand how much time is last to the core collapse. Okay, here uh, we have used the, the, the uh, Betelgeuse, which is uh, the, the nearby 200 parsec uh, um, uh, red supergiants, supposed to be a progenitor of a core collapse supernovae. And uh, unfortunately, we don't know the evolutionary uh, stage, and uh, and we and here you see the idea is that action eventually produced in the core when they escape and uh, travel within the star and our telescope, uh, they pass through 200 parsec of the magnetic field of the galaxy, and uh, and are transformed into X-ray. And here you see the spectra, the metro spectra, um, once uh, subtracted the background compared with. Uh, expectations in different evolutionary phase. Uh, here uh, is the time to the collapse. And so probably uh, our hypothesis or our hope is that uh, um, 
is that Betelgeuse is uh, in the helium burning, somewhere in the helium burning phase. Uh, so it's not a good uh, candidate for uh, this job, but maybe we may extend this kind of job to other, not so nearby, but to other galactic uh, uh, red supergiant to see if we may be more, more uh, lucky. And this is the result we get uh, uh, searching for a bound. Uh, and this is the kind of bound we get in this paper. If you are interested, you can see Mengiao et al, a couple of papers, the last one in, in 2022, 2022. Okay. So, uh, so this is a, a general remark. The conversion of photon is a general property of us that is effective also for other astronomical sources like magnetars. Magnetars are neutron stars with a, a huge magnetic fields. So in that case, the conversion occurs because the, uh, the, the magnetic fields of the, of the objects or active galactic nuclei, in particular blazars, may do that. May so looking at the spectra of the X-ray spectra of this object, we may infer about uh, the production of actions or action-like particles. So this is a special properties of actions, not shared by neutrinos. So let me go to the final part of the, as I promise, uh, uh, I made um, a search uh, in the most recent, uh, in the future um, 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 in technological development. And this is the <laughs> slide illustrated the capability um, of Euclid satellite that will be launched uh, soon in July, hopefully. Uh, from Cape Canaveral with a Falcon uh, uh, driver. And uh, this is a 1.2 meter telescope for infrared observations, red and infrared observation, essentially. There are two uh, detectors, one uh, at shorter wavelength and one at longer wavelength. And this is the ideal to study globular clusters, stars, and, uh, and may extend our investigation also to extragalactic galactic <laughs> cluster stars. And uh, being in the space, the spatial resolution is very good. We can go down to uh, 110 of arc seconds. So that is very good uh, uh, for our, to resolve the core of globular clusters. And uh, the, 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 due to the aperture of the telescope, the, the, the limit, uh, uh, in magnitude is not so strong, it's not so deep, uh, 24 in the, in the high magnitude, but, uh, but red giant stars and horizontal branch stars are bright objects, are among the brightest objects in the globular clusters. So we hope to extend our investigation to the resolved stellar population in the local group of galaxies. And this will come soon and the other uh, interesting object is the, the Vera Rubin, formerly the LSST uh, telescope, which is a, a ground-based telescope, 8.4 8 meter telescope. Uh, and it is a, a telescope for survey, uh, for photometric survey. So this is a, a, the successor of, of, the, of the Sloan uh, Digital Sky Survey. And uh, practically this, the capability, just to give you an idea, a, a, a full a, a sky uh, images of the, the of the of the of, of the sky will be taken every three to four nights. So we have a repeated sequence over ten years of works uh, uh, of a full sky with an high resolution, a deep photometry because uh, a, a, is an eight point four meters. The limiting magnitude is 27 in the high band. And, uh, and, uh, and most important, since we have uh, uh, this uh, uh, short wool, wool, um, wool uh, sky survey uh, with the short uh, terms between two images, we can uh, find a lot of variable star, including supernova. And it is, it is suspected that in 10 years, uh, um, um, the Vera Rubin may discover uh, uh, a few millions of new supernovae. 
and uh, and this is very important to, for uh, studying both uh, supernovae, core collapse supernovae, uh, and the progenitor of core collapse supernovae. Uh, and this is also coming soon, soon in the sense that the the commissioning uh, will start at end of uh, 2024, so next years, and the science uh, operation uh, should start in 2025. Okay, so uh, let me go to the conclusions. Uh, you can read it without saying. So we have several um, um, several astronomical sources, potential astronomical sources of actions, and uh, with uh, combining accurate models and uh, accurate observations, uh, we may constrain successfully constrain. Um, um, <laughs> action physics. Okay, thank you. Uh, oh, thanks. This is very interesting. Um, for observables related to the RGB branch, how sensitive are you to the triple alpha rate? To sorry, the triple alpha rate. Triple alpha rates. Oh, I don't know. I I have not the slides to show you. Uh, it's obviously uh, sensitive to the triple alpha rates. Uh, uh, the triple alpha um, uh, cross session is not is impossible to measure directly the mm. triple alpha rates. But we know that uh, a temperature in between 10 to the A and 10 to the 9, which is the typical temperature of helium burning in stars, not only in RGB, uh, it is dominated by two resonances. It's, it's a two process mm -hmm. um, um, process. Yeah, two state. step process. Yeah, uh, uh, two steps. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, the first is the alpha alpha in, mm -hmm. in uh, uh, brilliant eight, and then brilliant eight plus alpha in a, a carbon uh, carbon uh, 12 and there are two resonances in the beryllium 8 and the carbon 12 the, the famous carbon 12 oil resonances mm -hmm. that dominates so the parameters so the gamma uh, of these uh, the, the width of, and the strength of these resonances can be measured instead okay. so they, they, there is a let's say a phenomenological models in which these two Resonances dominates the cross sessions and measurements of the strength of these cross sessions. And this is the way we, and typically, uh, um, astro nuclear physicists tell us that the uncertainty is within 10%. Within and we consider this uncertainty in our error budget, theoretical error budget in general. Uh, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, uh, but um, uh, the, the RGB tip of course. Uh, is a borderline because of course at 10 to the eight, mm -hmm. which is the limit of this range in which we expect that these two, the two resonances dominate. Okay. And below 10 to the eight, we know that the, the two steps process does not work very well. And instead the sort of a real three body reactions uh, probably uh, is the way in which this right, reaction right. takes place. And so we have to modify the, 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 the theoretical. And there are theoretical investigation, very complicated calculation based on air matrix solutions of the Schrodinger equations that provide the information. But if you compare different theoretical um, model, you find huge differences between okay. one model and the others. So it is not clear what happened below 10 to the eight. Okay. And so in principle, th this may, affect the RGB tip uh, because it, it is a, a bit border borderline. No, because uh, the, the thing that I'm imagining is you, in principle, if you have an axion with nucleon couplings, it could modify the triple alpha rate as well. So you yeah. may be able to use your RGB observations to also place constraints on- Yeah, this has been done. Also. Has it been done already? Has oh. been already <laughs> done, yeah. Has been already done. And the, the, the answer is quite stringent. So, okay, in that sense. So, the, to, yes, of course, to reverse the argument and, and use the observation to constrain the, right, right, the cross right. sessions. Yeah, that, okay. that has been already done. There are oh. a couple of works with this, it was done. Okay, thanks. Um, so, thanks for the talk. And um, I would like to 
qualitatively, um, what's the dependence of the results on the modeling of the stellar evolution? Um, yeah, this are is, there other groups? This is the, the, the most important part of the job, is, right. to, uh, is to evaluate uh, uh, all the uncertainties in the theoretical models, no? Yeah, I have some slides. What we do exactly. Uh, okay, this is the procedure that we have. So we have uh, a list. Uh, we have a list uh, of inputs physics that modify, uh, that modify, uh, that may modify potentially uh, the predicted luminosity of the RGB tip in, the, in that case. So we have the mass loss rates, uh, the rates of the nitrogen 14P gamma reaction, which is uh, the bottleneck of the CNO, the oxygen burning in shell. So the triple alpha, the screening, the electron screening uh, recipe, recipes uh, used to um, um, modify uh, the, the potential, the um, electrostatic potential around a nucleus in a plasma, in a stellar plasma, for the triple alpha, the neutrinos rates, uh, um, the electron conductivity, uh, the radiative opacity, uh, the mixing length, which have to do with uh, efficiency of convections, uh, the boundary conditions, equation of state, microscopic diffusions, uh, and rotation included here. And here you see the, the uncertainty that we assume in the theory, the theoretical uh, inputs, and here the effect on the magnitude of the tip. And then what we do, uh, this is, this is, these are changing uh, uh, one parameter at once, no? But what happened, but there could be correlation between them. So in order to evaluate correlation, we have this machinery here, which we extract randomly with the Monte Carlo. We extract uh, the value uh, of, the, of these parameters, input parameters, uh, uh, according to the various distribution function error distribution function. Then we calculated the models up to the RGBT, store the RGBT luminosity, and then repeat them several times. And finally, we get uh, uh, these results. And this is the deviation from the, from the standard value of the magnitude of the top that we get. And this is the theoretical error, the one sigma of this, uh, of this uh, distribution function. So the answer is yes, we have to ta absolutely take into account. If we underestimate the error, we may get a very beautiful, a very stringent bounce, but this is because we are underestimating the error. So the error should be, and this is part of the game because in addition, on top of that, there are the error on the observations that are, should also be considered. And there are several sources of uncertainty also there. That should be considered. Okay. Yeah. I have a question on the. Um, you, you mentioned at the end the white dwarf luminosity function work, and there is this old data with a possible hint of a non-zero uh, electron action electron coupling. Yeah, this is not from the luminosity function, but rather what? in the cooling rates of a variable white dwarf. Just one case. Yeah, but there is also so some. Uh, there is also a contribution from the wider luminosity function. So they yeah, are, they are. Okay. But in that case, is an upper bound like this one, not an int. Well, in the case some, of some of the work of Jordi Cern point to a hint. Some others may be controversial. You know? But anyway, the, my question was that um, yeah, back then, a few years ago, people were looking forward to Gaia data to to increase the quality and the and the statistics of this this body of data. And I wanted to know if there is some, some effort in this direction. Going yeah, there is, the there is this tension. Uh, we, we hope to have in the future. Now, <laughs> another instrument that uh, was pl pl planned by the M3 uh, missions by uh, ESA, the European um, um, Space Agency, is the PLATO mission, which is a, 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 a new... Um, uh, instrument uh, uh, that will measure the essentially search uh, for uh, extrasolar planets, but it is also, um, it can be also used to measure uh, um, stellar uh, pulsations. And we hope with PLADO, which is much more sensitive than Kevlar, the previous one, uh, 
to have the possibility to observe uh, more uh, variable Y dwarfs and to see and to understand better this uh, tension with what we found. Sorry, I, I want to stress uh, this point. In order to uh, think about ins and not just the bounds, uh, since all these are indirect measurements, you, you don't see actions directly, but you see some effect of actions. In order to say, okay, I'm actually looking at, at action. This effect is certainly due to the production of actions. We have to exclude any alternatives. That's the point. And, and for with the RGB tips, with the R parameters, uh, uh, and even with the luminosity function or white door, there are alternatives explanations. So we can't say certainly this is an int in favor of, of actions. In the case of the of the um, cooling of white dwarf, this is more tricky because uh, white dwarfs are, are very simple objects, essentially. There are no nuclear reaction inside, so they are quite simple. So the, what are you, you are looking at is just to the cooling rates. And the cooling rates, uh, in, when they are hot, is due to neutrinos, essentially plasma neutrinos also in this case. But when, when they go down, it is, it is essentially uh, provided by the radiations. So if you have, and, and we don't know other mechanisms to lose energy in addition to production of thermal particles like neutrinos and actions. So in that case, uh, the, the, the ints may be, even if also in this case, we are measuring a variation of the periods. So not directly action, but a variation of the periods, no? of the pulsations. But in this case, uh, it appears in my opinions that uh, it's more, it, 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 this is a kind of indirect observation, which is more close to a direct observation. Let's may say in that case. So in this, in this sense, uh, uh, I hope that uh, with Plado, we may have uh, more variable white dwarfs uh, to test this possibility. That's important. Okay. Yes, uh, I um, have a question about the um, about the membership probabilities. Uh, could you, um, in the um, uh, galactic, um, sorry, in the ah, uh, contaminations? No, no, sorry, but the, the membership uh, probabilities in the Blow your cluster, sorry. Um, so how do you estimate them and do you take them into account in in your um, um, analysis as sort of weight in, in the likelihood function or something like that? Or so how, how do you estimate them and-, and uh, they... there, is, there are different approaches. One is to look, uh, uh, is to, look to star, which uh, do not deviate too much from the sequence in the color magnet diagrams. So you define the red giants, a spread in the red giants, which is compatible with the, with the statistical uh, uncertainties in the photometry, uh, in the color essentially. <laughs> uh, and then you exclude uh, two red or two blue stars, let's say. That's very, but this is the classical methods used in that way. Uh, a more, uh, um, a more, uh, Accurate way is to use is to use the proper, proper motions. So you compare um, later. I can show you some picture of that. You observe essentially you observe um, the same cluster at different epochs, no? Uh, different uh, after a few years, no? You have a photometry, and then you take the same photometry of the same field, but after a few years, and so and and you. Um, uh, uh, make a plot of the position of the star with respect to the center of mass of, of the clusters. And you immediately see that the, the, the cluster stars are around the center of mass, while the, the, the movements of the non-cluster members are outside. And so you may exclude them. There's a proper motion, essentially. But you need an uh, astrometric measurements. And Gaia exactly do that. Okay, we should probably stop here to have coffee. So maybe we can uh, have more discussion over coffee. Uh, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. And uh, meet back here, maybe at 11.35, so 20 minutes from now. <laughs>